1919 was a turning point in the Ukrainian National Liberation Revolution of 1917 to 1921. It became a test of the strength of the Ukrainian independent and sovereign state. After the victory of the armed uprising against the Hetmanet in December 1918, the Directory became the highest authority of the new Ukrainian People's Republic. At that time, it was a moment of triumph, its highest rise. It was planned to carry out reform of the agrarian sector and adjust the national economy to this sector. However, the critical political and military situation and external aggression threatened the existence of the young Ukrainian state. The 1919 was a year of triumph and tragedy in Ukraine. Its fate primarily depended on external factors. Although the Directory managed to achieve the expansion of the UNR's international relations, Ukraine was recognized by Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the Netherlands and the Vatican and other countries. But it failed to establish normal relations with the countries on which the success of the UNR depended – Soviet Russia as well as the Entente States and Poland. In fact, during the whole 19th year, continuous fighting took place on the territory of Ukraine. It was the year of the bloody and brutal confrontation. These were the bloodiest and, at the same time, the most heroic times of the Ukrainian liberation struggle. Simon Petlura became the head of state. It was such an important political thing as the attempt for Ukraine to get international recognition, when it was already clear that the states of the Fourth Union had lost the war. Germany and Austria-Hungary capitulated, and the Entente countries, England, France and their US ally were actually devising a new geopolitical agenda. The map of Europe was being redrawn. The year 1919 began for Ukraine with the second offensive of the Russian Bolshevik army. On January 3rd, the Bolsheviks seized Kharkiv and established the authority of the Provisional Soviet Government of Ukraine which a decree proclaimed the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic. On January 16, the Bolshevik armed forces, which were known as the troops of the Provisional Soviet Government of Ukraine, launched an offensive against Ukraine without declaration of war. In response, the UNR Directory declared war on Bolshevik Russia. In the context of Russia's external aggression, on January 22, an event of great historical significance took place at the Sofia Square in Kiev. The UNR Directory proclaimed the Act of Union for the unification of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Western Ukrainian People's Republic into the single Council Ukraine. As for the act, it was first and foremost the merit of tens of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who died on the fronts of the liberation struggle. As for the politicians seriously involved in promulgating the act of unity, was probably Pitlura, who put most of his efforts as a politician for Ukraine to become a unified state. There were many politicians and representatives of the leadership of the Western Ukrainian People's Republic. Among them were Yevhen Petrushevich and Lohin Tsehelsky. These were military figures who managed to recapture Ukrainian territories. The UNR army, which began to form in autumn of 1918, was reorganized in the spring of the following year. Five independent military groups were formed from 11 divisions and were led by such well-known commanders as Yevhen Konovalets and Yuri Tutunik. Ukrainian troops had to fight against the invaders on several fronts. These were very difficult times. There was a so-called quadrilateral of death. On the one side, there were White Guard troops. On the other, the troops of Red Russia. On the third side, Polish troops. From the east, the volunteer army under the command of General Denikin came to Ukraine. In June 1919, it captured Kharkiv and the Donbass. In August, the troops occupied Mykolaiv. General Anton Denikin was one of those classic examples of the leaders of the so-called White Guard movement, who wanted to restore the Russian state. He was a Russian patriot 
and therefore was an undying fighter for the restoration of a unified and indivisible Russian state. The Denikin followers destroyed not only everything Ukrainian, but also organized mass Jewish pogroms. Battles between Ukrainian troops and parts of the Denikin Volunteer Army continued during September to October 1919. Finally, under the blows of the Bolshevik Army, the remnants of the Denikin units retreated to Crimea. No less difficult was the situation in the western part of Ukraine. Against the Western Ukrainian People's Republic and the Ukrainian Galician Army, Poland waged a war in an attempt to annex Galicia and Volyn. In April 1919, the 80,000-strong army of General Galler was formed in France and was sent to the Ukrainian-Polish front. It radically changed the balance of military forces. The Antanta, which supplied this army with weapons, set the condition to use it only against the Red Army. However, the leader of Poland, Józef Pilsudski and Gallery, decided to use it in the offensive against the Galician Army and the UNR Army. In these conditions, negotiations with the Antanta were very important, but the leaders of the Antanta got information from the White Guard officers, who were in their embassies in the capitals of the Antanta, from Denikin diplomats, from other figures of the White Guard movement. They informed that Ukrainians were a bunch of rebels, whom Denikin would soon eliminate. In fact, it was a fatal mistake of the leaders of the Antanta states. If they supported the Ukrainian People's Republic, it is quite possible that then there would not have been the Soviet Union in the form that it was formed in the early 1920s, and the geopolitical agenda would have been completely different. The Directory of the UNR understood the threat of the Antanta's military forces for its state and repeatedly tried to neutralize this powerful military potential. Negotiations were conducted by Petluro's emissaries with the Antanta troop general Delvik and other figures. The Antanta ceased to support Polish aggression and the white movement on the territory of Ukraine, that is, the White Guard troops. It had to conclude an agreement with the Ukrainian People's Republic and recognize it as a state entity. Unfortunately, it did not happen. There were some declarations made, but they failed to succeed. Ukraine's war with Poland, supported by the Antanta, continued until mid-July 1919. Due to the impossibility of holding the front against the superior forces of the Polish interventionists, the troops of the Ukrainian Galician army were forced to retreat to the territory of the Dnipro Ukraine. They united with the UNR army and, with the support of the rebel peasant movement in August 1919, were able to counterattack the Russian Red Army. Together, they were able to liberate most of the right bank of Ukraine. However, not all insurgent peasant units helped the UNR army. The so-called Nestor Makhno Revolutionary Rebel Army in 1919 took control of the southern Ukrainian territories all the way from Berdyansk to Taganrog, the city of Katerinoslav, today Dnipro, and Zaporizhia. The tragic page of the history of the Ukrainian liberation movement is the relationship between Nestor Makhno and his rebel army with the Ukrainian People's Republic. Makhno had a very powerful armed force as of the year 1919. Without military allies, Nestor Makhno went in rapprochement with the directory of the Ukrainian People's Republic. On September 20, 1919, a deal was made between Simon Petlura and Nestor Makhno at the Zmerinka station. Both sides pledged to create a united front against a common enemy. In case of victory, the UNR pledged to provide Makhno with autonomous territory to build the so-called Free Soviet system. But probably Makhno overestimated his capabilities. One by one, victories over Denikin gave them the illusion that they, without the help of other political forces, would come to all the working people of Ukraine. For a year, Makhno annulled the alliance with Petlura and again went to battle with the Russian Bolsheviks. 
This time they used the rebel army to liberate Crimea from Baron Rangel's troops. Perhaps if Makhno went to the side of the Ukrainian People's Republic and fought with Petlura, together with the UNR for the statehood of Ukraine, the situation would have changed. But Makhno, having great military power, did not have a vision of the arrangement of Ukraine. During the summer to autumn of 1919, the Directory attempted to stabilize the military political situation in Ukraine. However, the open aggression of several foreign countries and the unfriendly attitude of the Antanta leaders to the independence of the UNR nullified these efforts. At a time when the UNR army was fighting on several fronts, a peace conference began in Paris. It was summoned by the victorious countries in World War I. At the conference, the Ukrainian delegation hoped to uphold the independence of its state. Ukraine has paid the highest price it could ever pay for participating in the Brest Peace Treaty. Ukrainians were considered traitors. The Ukrainian delegation wasn't allowed onto the territory of France at all. With great difficulty and in different ways, they managed to enter French territory. The press was extremely anti-Ukrainian. As such, it was obvious that the Russian agency took all possible measures to not allow Ukraine's independence and recognition. When the peace conference began, the Ukrainians were not seated at the tables with the victors and not with the allies, but with those who lost the war. They were not given the right to vote. That is, Ukrainians, like those who lost the war, were simply forced to wait for their destiny. However, despite this attitude on the part of the victorious countries of World War I, the Ukrainian delegation worked very hard, trying to find supporters. It intended to seek the recognition of the independence of the UNR, the withdrawal of foreign troops from Ukrainian territory, and give assistance to the Antanta in the fight against Bolshevik Russia and General Denikin's army. In Paris, support from the Ukrainian delegation was provided by Ukrainian and U.S. representatives. Despite certain differences in the views of the Antanta delegations regarding the solution of the Ukrainian issue, they were united in their desire to prevent Bolshevism from penetrating Europe. According to them, large countries could resist this threat. On June 25, 1919, it was decided that the Antanta recognized the right of the Polish Republic to occupy Galicia in order to protect the civilian population from the dangers of Bolshevik gangs. The recognition of the UNR never happened. All the newly created states appeared on the territory of the former Russian Empire. Baltic countries, the Polish state and Czechoslovakia on the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was a parade of nation-states on the ruins of two vast empires. But Alas Ukraine was not included in this spirit of statehood. And that was the payment for those strategic mistakes that were made. There is no such term or notion as if in history. Probably Ukraine's history could have gone a completely different way. And perhaps we could have been among the ranks of such countries as modern Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary. But Alas, when we were thrown to the ground, we were after all simply the victims of Bolshevik aggression. Thus, the year 1919 began with the proclamation of the Act of Union on the unification of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Western Ukrainian People's Republic into a unified Council Ukraine. But it was marked by the struggle for international recognition of Ukraine and an armed confrontation with the enemy on different fronts. Even when under pressure from the Bolshevik forces, the UNR army was forced to withdraw to Poland. From December 1919, the winter struggle began at the rear of the Red and Volunteer Armies, which lasted until November 1921.